It's great to be back again with Nolan. Um, we had a previous conversation and uh, I found Nolan to be really fascinating because Nolan is doing something a little bit similar to what Jordan Peterson talks about when he's talking about people who are playing games. And sometimes they don't know the rules of the game until they've played the game long enough for the rules to start to make sense. And so Nolan does this thing where he plays with ideas, but he's sort of, it's sort of like a game in his mind. And then the rules of the game start to become clear. And then it sort of turns into a kind of a formula for you that you can play with and do different things. Is that about the, the way you would summarize what we talked about last time? Yeah. Um, that, um, yeah. So first of all, um, I, I, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't know if anybody else has already talked about this, uh, philosophically, uh, I'm not very well read in terms of what, um, what people have already discussed. Um, and so this may be a very well-known thing in a, in a certain niche, um, mm -hmm. but, um, like the philosophy of science um niche but um when it comes to uh electricity and magnetism which is kind of um the little intuitive domain of science that i'm familiar with mm -hmm. that i've kind of come up through from a kid uh, um uh what i found it, what what i think i found is that um uh as adults scientists when they face something that they don't understand um, they'll try and use things that they're comfortable with from their childhood uh, or they're comfortable with from other parts of their life um, that seem to be secure and stable and, um, you know, having fun over there, right, in that part of my life. Um, and then they try and find uh, the ideas that they can create analogies to this new thing that they're uncertain about and they're trying to describe it and figure it out. and um, so one of the fundamental games of electricity and magnetism is flow through a conductor due to a source. And this is a, uh, the type of game that we can all uh, probably remember um, uh, as kids playing in the front yard with uh, uh, like sprinklers or hoses and, and uh, like in the summertime in South Texas, that would kind of be a common occurrence. Yeah. Um, and so you could, uh, or washing the car or something like that. Um, so you probably remember uh, kinking the hose and noticing that you could control the hose, the flow through the hose, um, uh, you know, all the way from full blast to nothing and anywhere in between. Um, and um, that's one of the games that uh, uh, electricity and magnetism uh, plays. Right, so we play a game of there are electrons. Um, this is how we describe them, and uh, they move. Um, and when they move, uh, you have a flow. And here's the math that describes it. Um, and so, um, uh, and the flow is analogous to a flow through a conductor due to a source. Um, so. Um, um, so anyways, so basically the, 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 I think, um, I think the word icon, uh, is being used, but, mm -hmm. um, essentially the, um, the, the story, the narrative, the icon, the game, um, that I'm playing here is, um, uh, well, anyways, I'm not doing a good job, but <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm completely with you. So you have this flow through a conductor due to a source and yeah. you have this analogy to um, something that you were comfortable doing as a kid. And so that, so because you are, uh, you work in uh, circuit design and so you work with yeah. elect electricity, I mean, electronics all the time. So, so when you're facing a, a conundrum in your work, trying to figure out, you know, how can I do this new thing that's never been done before? You have to have some places to go with your analogies in order to help you make your way forward. And that's what we all do in, in any domain, right? And, that, and part of the reason we can do that, I think, is that these truths that exist in one domain just happen to show up in other domains as well. 
So we have these handy analogies that help us figure things out. And that, I think that's one of the amazing things about the way the cosmos is constructed. Yes. And I think, um, I think the analogy is, um, I, I think something about the analogy or the analogizable thing is, um, is kind of where the game can be found. So, um, or what the game is. It's, the game is recognizing a pattern that you can interact with um, in a way that has fun and it is productive. Um, uh, I think that's, I think that's it. So anyway, so, so scientists do the same thing when we, when we uh, are exploring things and we get to the point where, um, you know, we will never, we will never see an electron. We'll never have a photograph of an electron um, because it's too small, right? It's, it's that small. The electron is an idea that's uh, invisible. Um, and uh, um, so that's kind of where the game uh, begins for uh, electricity and magnetism. Uh, um, uh, so, so, so you but, have to find some sort of analogy to describe the electron then? Um, uh, I'm not going to be able to do it better than everybody else has done. Uh -huh. um, but but I mean, um, that's all what they're the doing. yeah, but all the math is based on electrons in motion, right? Or counts of electrons here minus counts of electrons there, and the distance that separates them. And then uh, insulars are materials that do not let their electrons move on or off of them easily. The valence electrons and conductors um, allow their valence electrons to move freely, um, right? Uh, so there's this whole elaborate game of conductors and insulators and um, electronic components and devices um, that you can use to build circuits and things, right? Like um, uh, there, uh, there was an electrical engineer, his last name was Armstrong, and he had the crazy idea of putting a radio in a car, right? Um, but not not just like the idea of doing it, like designing one, like it never been designed, um, and um, so anyways, and it, and that type of game, only it it comes from uh, this lower level game um, of a flow through a conductor um, due to a source. Um, you know, you can join higher up if you're interested, but at the very bottom, it's still a game. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess because I don't know anything about how these things work, even a radio situated in my house is some kind of magic. Like there's, yeah. there's stuff that comes through the air and goes into this box and then out of it comes sound. It's like, how does right. that work? <laughs> right, right, right. To, to me, the magic begins kind of where, uh, uh, and I only am super familiar with kind of the terminology because of Kathy loves physics but um, like electricity and magnetism uh, brief um, informal unprofessional history of it is um, when when um, scientists first started to try and model it mathematically or think about magnetism mathematically um, they were using ideas um, kind of, they were trying to analogize or copy paste um, ideas from gravity so force across a distance, you know, um, due to the amounts of charge instead of due to the amounts of mass. And um, uh, so they had, they had a, a, I think, a couple hundred years of uh, scientific jargon and nomenclature and ways to say stuff that everybody had kind of agreed on for electricity and magnetism. Uh, and then Faraday came along, and I don't know if you know who that character was, but um, uh, he basically had no credentials and he had no education, um, but he had a, an interest. And so he um, got a job as a janitor uh, working at the, um, the science laboratory or Royal Institute of Science or something like that. And um, so, um, so he, he kind of just did experiments or looked at stuff in the lab and then was like, eh, it doesn't seem to look like that. I see something that looks more like this, and he described it a different way. But he didn't know math, so he didn't write math for it. Uh, and then 
um, uh, years later, a younger guy came along, um, but while they're still alive, right, together, and was like, well, I don't know what Faraday's talking about, really, but here's the math that describes it, and that was uh, Gauss, um, and uh, so it's just a different math trick to look at it a different way, and then it's like, oh, yeah, that's the relationship between electric current and magnetic field. Um, so, well, I didn't know that about Faraday, and I didn't know that about Gauss. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, but but Gauss did include the statement when when uh, like it was published or became public or whatever. I don't know. Went viral, uh, basically saying, you know, I I don't really know, you know, what is going on, but here's the math, mm -hmm. right? So, like, I'm not the expert in the field, but this is the math that works. Um, and then Gauss was the guy who recruited Riemann um, and um, uh, mentored him in the direction of math of differences or something like that. Or he, but he's the guy who recruited Riemann um, and then like differential geometry, which is the complex part of Einstein's theories, I guess. Um, uh, um, so anyways, so it's, it's just interesting. Um, well, and then but, wasn't yeah, there, so I, I, mean, I watched. Maybe, you, maybe you've heard this story too. I heard it from uh, Stephen Strogatz doing a lecture one time on, on the beauty of calculus. But apparently um, when Maxwell was looking at electricity and magnetism, he, he saw a certain way of doing the math. And then he decided to, I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but it, it, he decided to do it with a different kind of math. And I think maybe he, he was using calculus instead of whatever math had been used. And all of a sudden he saw it in a hmm. new way. And that was what clued him in that electric electricity and magnetism were actually like one thing, like electromagnetism. And then that's what brought forth all these new ideas about light and that light is actually photons and all that stuff. So. Hmm. Yeah, there is something about when you when you take something and you turn it over and you look at it from another perspective, it really changes the whole um, changes the whole picture. It gives you all sorts of new insights. I was listening yeah. to a video yeah. today from a, a musician guy or music theory guy who is talking about the history of <clears throat> music theory and how back in something like 1700. They started thinking about how to conceptualize the kind of universe of musical objects. So conceptual spaces for musical objects, you know, where all the chords and notes and everything fit inside this kind of universe of objects. And just last week, I was watching a guy talking about the conceptual spaces of language and how words and semantics and syntactics all fit in this conceptual space. And it's exactly the way I think about art, that all the elements and principles of design inhabit a conceptual space. And now you're talking about all these science ideas that are analogous with all these games and so forth. They're inhabiting a kind of conceptual space that you can sort of play around in. You can walk around in there and see things. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, when you were talking about the um, um, music and different chords, um, uh, a, a science historian is probably better to ask about this <clears throat> than myself, but um, Kepler, the astronomer, mm -hmm. um, I think he had that as a fascination. I think that was one of his top few, um, the concept that uh, um, uh, if you made a mathematical function of everything that exists, uh, there should be a periodicities to things that just, uh -huh. anyways, he, I think he was fascinated with something I'm like gonna that. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, don't, I'm not the historian, but I think that, I think that's there. And mm -hmm. then, um, um, uh, not, uh, and then Laplace and Fourier, um, that is the central theorem or a central idea to uh, their thinking, like their math. Um, uh, Laplace transforms, 
and Fourier transforms. Um, basically, that any function um, is, um, you know, if you find the right coefficients modeled by this uh, expression uh, or this, uh, yeah. so yeah. Anyways, they're 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 uh, integral transforms, um, but uh, yeah. Um, well, so I've gotten you far afield from your original concept that you wanted to talk about today. Oh no, it's it's uh, yeah. You can bring it back. <laughs> so you sent me an email um, with some some ideas that you wanted to talk about and. Uh, you, you made the statement at one point, you said, this was my first good question. What is yeah. mathematics? Yeah. So do you kind of want to start there and talk about that? After I wrote it, it felt like, well, that's probably a weird thing to say, but at the time it felt like the exact right thing to say. Um, so, um, uh, so my first good question was what is mathematics? Um, uh, I don't know why, but, um, uh, I was like 19 or 20 or 21 years old, and um, I was having uh, conversations with kids at church about, um, you know, like uh, science and and religion and stuff like that. Um, and so it kind of led to some uh, interesting places. And then at, back at home, uh, I asked myself, you know, what what is mathematics? You know, and uh, growing up, people were always like, oh, math is a language. You know, math is of this, math is of that. Artistic answers to the question, which are perfectly acceptable. Um, but at that point, I wanted a definition that excluded um, logic and excluded um, certain things that uh, nobody considered to be math, um, but seemed similar um, or seemed to satisfy the definitions. Um, so, um, so anyways, so I asked myself that question and then it, the, the little journey to answer it, to find an answer that satisfied me, uh, I asked myself, what's an idea, right? So it was like abstract thing. Um, and then, and this took, this took a while. This probably took uh, a couple weeks to, of thinking. Um, I read through books we had, I went to the library, got online, went, hit Google, right? Um, this was in probably 2008 or nine. Um, and, um, uh, but anyway, so, so I, I went, what is thinking? What is communication? Um, and uh, so anyway, so I came up with all these little definitions and I, I was basically playing around with what I now call uh, knowledge space um, and what, you know, what, what's going on about that. Um, but um, so the definition I came up with is that mathematics is a system of thought um, comprised of or composed of um, uh, numbers, arithmetic, algebra, you know, go ahead and add the label um, that you want to include. Um, uh, and by system, I mean a set of methods and rules. So a method would be how to do something and a rule would just be um, like how you can't do something. Well, why can't I do that? Well, the rule. Or, um, hey, I want to do something else. It's like, well, you can't do that. Why not? Uh, the rule. Um, so a set of methods, how to do stuff, and rules um, um, for thinking. Um, and it wasn't, and so that was, that was many years ago. And um, the answer has basically satisfied me even till now. Um, and um, so to me that, you know, I don't really care what other people think at this point. It's like, to me, that's, that's what math is. And when I talk about math or when I listen to people talking about math, it's a set of methods and rules for thinking. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, is that the meditative kind of exploration you're any? Well, yeah. I mean, it, I, I go off in a lot of different directions. Part of it, leads me to think about, um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the videos I've done with Glenn, where he talks about computation, because he doesn't think of computation as a strictly, you know, like you said, you wanted to exclude logic from your definition. And 
And I think yeah. um, Glenn excludes logic from his definition of computation because he's thinking of computation more as a computation is a thing, but in another way, it's an analogy of almost everything, of how almost everything works. Because um, when musicians are playing a symphony, they're executing a computation that was the rule set of which is written up by the composer and also consists of all the rules that exist within music. All of those rules are consist in this universe. So then when the musicians are playing the music, they're executing that rule set. And so that's what computation is. So if mathematics is a set of methods, is a system of thought comprised of a set of methods and rules for thinking, then that is also a good definition of music. <laughs> except you have, it would be a different set of, that's comprised in there, right? It wouldn't be uh, numbers, arithmetic, geometry, algebra. It would be notes, chords, note. harmonies, resonances, all of that. And it would also be painting because painting is a system of thought comprised of elements and principles for uh, painting composed of, and then all the things that, that I talk about all the time. So, yeah, that's a that's a, a wonderful if systematic could, way of thinking about things. If I could modify the music one just a tiny amount, um, I would I would um, I would um, not want to take away the thought, but I might say it's a system of expression, mm -hmm. um, and and then yeah. thought could be a form of expression, um, but it's a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, certainly. I mean. I, although I don't know exactly what it is when when the, it is said that when Mozart conceived of a symphony, it would come to him complete in one thought, essence, expression inside his head. And then he'd have to break mm -hmm. it down into the pieces so that he could send out to the to the instruments the various parts that they were to play. But inside his mm -hmm. head, it came to him as a whole thing. Now, I don't know. Is that a thought? Is that a, is that some sort of imaginary conceptual space? You know that that would not be consistent with thought. I'm not sure. But the other thing that interested me about what you said was um, that rules are what not to do, mm -hmm. and that that's not the way. I mean, I don't think we typically think of rules that way but it makes so much sense to think of it that way because what it's, you're really doing is you're putting in guardrails yeah and i i never thought about this too much until i started playing wordle have you ever played wordle it's a simple um, online game that gives you you have five spaces and you you're supposed to guess a five letter word and the the game will show you if you have the right letters, but they're in the wrong order, the letter mm -hmm. will light up as yellow. But if it's the right letter in the right space, it'll light up as green. And so that gives you a mm. clue each time as to how close you're getting to the correct word. But when you play mm. that game, you discover all of a sudden, there are all sorts of combinations that just don't work in English that are not any sort of a rule that anybody ever taught us. But there are they're just our word. There are combinations of letters that look like they ought to be a word, but they're not a word. <laughs> and why is huh. that? You know, there's all sorts huh. of guardrails there that say, no, you can't go there. You can't go there. That is not going to work. And as you're playing the game, you're kind of like, well, that's interesting because nobody ever taught us that as a rule. And yet we, we, we uh, intuitively know yeah, that's not a good direction to head. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good definition for rules. Hmm. It, it may be um, that there's also other types, like um, uh, instead of don't do, maybe like do uh, rules. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, um, so, but I think the easiest uh, like way to grasp it is um, like don't divide by zero. 
Like that's just something you don't do. Why not? Well, because you're asking a question and the question is nonsense. So that's why you don't do it. Well, could you say um, more about that? Oh yeah, sure. So um, when you have uh, one divided by zero, you're asking the question um, uh, about uh, putting one in uh, no containers. You're asking about putting something in no container. Well, if you have no container, you're not going to put it anywhere. If that's, uh, you know, you have no container. That's a brilliant way so, to look at fractions. I never thought about fractions that way. Yeah. Right? So, like yeah. one over four, you have four containers. So, how much of one you have to divide one up and put it into those four containers? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so the game you're playing is setting things in containers. And once you realize that, then you have to, th th I love doing this. I love asking myself, imagine being the first person, no, no, imagine being next to the first person who discovered division. You know, they probably discovered it by taking a pile of pebbles and like drawing circles on the ground and then just moving equal numbers to the different circles and then the idea of division lit up in their head for the first time, right? And like, wow. And, uh, and they wouldn't be able to express or communicate that idea to anybody with them understanding it, unless they follow them on the journey, unless they play the game with them. Um, so yeah, so division is probably a very, very old game. Uh, and one divided by zero is like, you know, give me a container to put it in uh, or we can't play. Well, so the first person that came up with zero. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because sure, because if if zero, if there are places that zero can't be used, and still zero is incredibly useful and has made mathematics do all kinds of things that we couldn't do before zero came along. There must be yeah. a great story there. So, um, so first of all, there's a lot of good history on it and you're not going to hear any of it from me, you know, but, um, <laughs> um, but I have wondered. Um, so um, most, most, uh, math, most mathematicians or math nerds are kind of familiar how uh, Roman numerals, there's not a numeral for zero. Um, so you had a whole number system for a uh, civilization that dominated its geographic region for about a thousand years. And the, the number system used by that human civilization didn't have a zero, right? So the concept of zero wasn't super well established uh, in its number representation. Um, uh, and you go over to South America, uh, or Central America, and you find that the Mayans had the zero and they were using it with great effect. And um, you go over to India or Asia and you find um, uh, uh, the, the zero being used in uh, digits and decimal point systems, right? So, um, so to me, that's fascinating, right? Like why, why, um, like that's a standout, right? Like Roman numerals are kind of a standout from the other systems of math. And um, uh, you know who we have to thank for finally getting rid of Roman numerals? Uh, it's, uh, it's Fibonacci. So everybody's like, oh, Fibonacci this, Fibonacci that. But really his entire life, like the number one accomplishment was bringing the digit and decimal point system to Europe. Uh, his dad was a merchant, so he got exposed to Fibonacci, got, got exposed to it in India, and um, he realized that this is a no-brainer. Uh, once you know how to do it, you can do math so much more easy, uh, so much um, more efficiently for common business calculations, computation, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he did was he wrote a book, and it was an inspirational work, essentially. Um, uh, hey guys, check out this new fangled math here. You know what the kids are doing on YouTube, and um, <laughs> uh, and and it was it was you know just arithmetic problems was what it was, 
Um, well, it showed you the numbering system and then it gave you arithmetic problems. And one of the riddles was if you had a rabbit and it took so long to mature and then it would have a baby and it took so long to, uh, right? That, so it set up this elaborate question with um, <clears throat> reproducing rabbits. And uh, the question was, at any given month, how many rabbits do you have? And the Fibonacci sequence is just the answer to that riddle, right? So uh, people going, oh, it's a Fibonacci sequence. That's just uh, people like finding the pattern somewhere else. But the Fibonacci sequence is just the answer to a riddle in the most um, uh, successful mathematical pamphlet of all time, you know, like publication of all time. <laughs> uh so anyways but um but yeah so um and this and this uh i'm gonna stray off here uh haven't already but um but uh really when i stop and think about fibonacci and moving from the uh, roman numerals to the digit decimal point system um uh uh it's um it's interesting to visualize the mass of an idea um and so the idea, if you ask the question, what number system do we want to teach the next generation, right? So that's a question. So that's an object in knowledge space. And then the answer is going to be an object in knowledge space. So you fill in the blank on the answer, and it's Roman numerals, right, when Fibonacci is born. But then eventually it changed to add digits and a decimal point, right? That's the type of numbers we want to teach the next generation. Um, so the, the, the mass of an idea, um, it, it's something, right? Like for that, I, for that um, uh, answer to change, to move from uh, uh, Roman numerals to digit and decimal point is um, a thought experiment I do to kind of justify saying, yeah, you know, ideas can have masks, right? Like we should have, um, we should have a term which uh, uh, indicates the mass of an idea. And then I just described its motion, right? Um, from this to this. Um, so we should be comfortable with saying, okay, motion of an idea. And if we're comfortable with the mass of an idea and the motion of it, then we should be comfortable productively evaluating the two of those things and saying whatever this productive evaluation is, is analogous to momentum, but, but it's momentum in knowledge space. Something like that. So, so switching from the digit, switching from the Roman numeral system to the digit and decimal system is analogous to um, momentum because it's the motion of an idea that that the idea has. I think you said mass, right? Not math. It has mass. An idea has mass, yeah. and it has motion. And so, um, mass in motion is momentum. Is that that's right? So we can talk about the momentum of ideas. Now, what they yeah. often say is that, was it Kuhn or Popper that said that, that fra scientific frameworks usually don't change until the generation, until several generations have died off because they keep holding on to the old ideas even after the new ones have become prominent. Now, did that happen with with what Fibonacci was trying to do, or did he manage to get that whole thing done in one generation? Um, to be honest, I don't remember. And I think we, I, I would, I, I, I want someone like Kathy Loves Physics or Grant Sanderson or whoever to, uh -huh. to do a deep dive and yeah. um, bring that, bring that content to the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's there, right? And it's special, I can just tell, but um, I haven't, uh, done the deep dive, so I don't. I don't know the dates. I don't know the names. I don't know the elegances of mm -hmm. the story, um, but I do know kind of the skeleton. Um, 
Um, and I know that um, uh, uh, probably need to, um, well, I don't know if we need to do anything, but, um, you know, it's just, but it's I mean, just I'm fun. just thinking about this idea of momentum. Is there a yeah. way to measure the momentum of an idea, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. So, so the reason, the reason I mentioned momentum is because um, this is the, I think, I think this is the game that uh, Newton's giants were playing, um, whatever you want to call it. So, um, so Newton's law about force, where he, uh, he basically had force is the ratio, right? So, okay. So once, once I get you comfortable with saying, uh, playing the momentum game with me in knowledge space, mm -hmm. then I'm going to rapidly copy and paste in a couple hundred years of science. Just, okay. just 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 paste in the analogy okay and and just be able to poof everything we've taught you about physics um and electricity and magnetism there's probably an analogy here right so um so momentum uh is the game that newton's force is based on so um newton said hey let's uh let's make a ratio well first of all ratio is an idea so we know we're in idea space so we have a ratio um, and in the numerator or on the top, we're going to put change in momentum, right? So if we've already agreed that momentum is mass times velocity, right? Or it's mass times the first change function of the position function, right? If we've already agreed to play this game, then let's make a ratio of the change in momentum uh, in the numerator and in the denominator. We'll put the interval over which the change occurred. And then that ratio will say that's equal to the force that caused the change over that interval. And so you have, uh, so now you have force right and so you can start playing uh, elaborate games with uh, forces in knowledge space okay um so force is the ratio of the change in momentum over the interval of the change the interval over which the change occurred so, um, so in, in this case, the change in momentum was going from the digital decimal, I mean, going from the um, Roman numeral system to the digital decimal system. And the interval over which that change occurred, we're not sure, but we think it was one generation. <laughs> it took right? a while. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so that would equal the force in knowledge space. Um, you're correct. The interval is the time. Um, and also the space, so Europe, um, and then the change in momentum. The momentum is the mass times the first change function of the position. So the position in this case is the answer to the question. Um, the first change function is the function that describes, uh, we went from Roman numeral to digit decimal point. So so the first change function in this in, in this particular example is um, uh, a unit step um, because we haven't at, up to now gone to a different one. Mm -hmm. So the the example here um, is hard to see change functions, but it's easy to see momentum. So I'm trying to so the the Fibonacci thought experiment is to really show you mass of ideas exist, mm -hmm. right? And then let's play the game of momentum. But the, but the, this particular example just has um, uh, a simple uh, change. Um, but yes, I think so, I want to say so you, yes. So you want to so, give, but you want to give me another example. So we, if we have more examples, yeah, we can okay. get a deeper understanding. So let's have, um, let's have an idea of like a dynamic, um, massive idea. Um, uh, should we do fashion like clothes? 
I, I haven't done this. We're we're just riffing right now. Okay. okay? So okay. let's let's take uh let's take a uh, fashion clothes. So this this may end up nowhere, right? I I do this. I'll find a a thought experiment. And I'll eh, that one doesn't work because of this reason or whatever. Um. Okay. So let's take clothes. So um, this decade, if you want, if you're a builder for a house, you're gonna ask yourself, what is the color scheme of the kitchen, right? The, of the house I'm gonna build and sell, right? So you want to put a color scheme and a design in the kitchen which people wanna buy. Um, well, we all know that stuff kind of goes in trends. So you're gonna wanna follow the trend. So the answers to your questions are basically the trend. Um, uh, what color this should be, what size that should be, what brand this should be, what material that should be, how the lighting should be designed. These are all um, uh, things that you can see and touch that um, you can easily see the knowledge space um, points that are connected to this physical thought experiment. Mm -hmm. um, the colors, the materials, right? These are all answers to questions. So they're objects in knowledge space um, that have a position, um, white, black, brown, red, green, right, whatever. Um, and um, so, okay, so you've got, um, you have um, uh, points in knowledge space for mm -hmm. the answers. Those answers can move around the knowledge space um, and you can start taking change functions um, of those positions, right? So you can look at basically the first derivative is the first change function and the second derivative, you know, bear with me here, is the second change function. Um, and um, um, uh, um, so, so you're not gonna see it on your daily or your yearly basis, but let's say you've been a home builder for 200 years and you have 200 years worth of data. So you should be able to go back through that data and see what was wanted for kitchen design in the, the teens, the aughts, the 90s, the 80s, the, all the way back to, you know, my house is from the 30s. Um, so I don't even think it had a bathroom when it was built. I think it had an outhouse. Um, so, um, so, but you can, you can go back and then you can watch the change. And we know that stuff comes in and it goes out, right? So this decade, it'll be this color that you wanna put and that decade, it'll be another color. And it's like, oh, we're back, you know, uh, we're doing this other color again. Um, so, so you can start to see that the change functions might be interesting. Um, and then you might ask yourself, well, what is changing the trends? What, is, um, what are the forces going on uh, on knowledge space or in knowledge space that um, are moving these ideas around um, from here to there. Um, and uh, I don't know if this, I, I, think, I think this is a decent, I think this is a decent one, but it, it's kind of elaborate to set it all up. But I think this is a decent thought experiment. Well, it space. certainly brings something to my mind that when you started explaining it, because I mean, I've watched this go on through my life, obviously, all these different trends. When I was a young married, it was in the 70s. And, you know, that's when they had the shag rugs and the, the avocado refrigerators and all of that kind of stuff. Right. But what I don't understand is if the builders are following the trend but the builder wants to build what people are going to buy. And the builder is always motivated by what people will buy. And so he would be very risk averse to try something off trend. How is it that the trend ever changes? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I, have, um, I have a number of siblings and um, I watch people and then one of them, I'll, I re would realize, wow, they're, 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 they're like influential, you know, if they say this, their friends do it, you know, or another one like, and eh, nobody was listening to that guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why people do stuff all the time. It, it's complex. So like yeah. a good scientist, yeah. I would say, oh, it depends. And yeah. maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's there, it's there. There's, 
I think, and it does I think go, you can ask those questions. And it does go in cycles. I mean, I don't know that the that will ever cycle back to hoop skirts and men wearing uh, knickers with tights. I don't know if we'll ever go back there, but we certainly are cycling back to the 70s. I've seen the 70s clothing fashion come back at least twice during my lifetime. And, you know, strangely enough, people are talking about the 90s as though that's something that they want to bring back again. I'm like, the 90s wasn't even... It wasn't even a fashion in the 90s, as far as I can remember. <laughs> but people want uh, yeah, to go back. It was tie-dyed tie t-shirt. Oh, is that the 90s? Eh, wasn't it, though? When, I mean, were, when were you born, Nolan? I was uh, born in the late 80s. Okay. So for me, the 90s were tie-dyed t-shirts and watermelon, you know, in the summer. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's it. <laughs> yeah. People want to go back to what? what 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 was their comfort spot when they were young you know people want to go back to their memories and so um i guess that's one of the reasons that music keeps cycling back that's why we can we yeah. can, we can access on spotify you know the music of the 50s and the music of the 60s and of the 70s and they yeah the 70s doesn't exactly have a sound the 70s was many 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 different sounds kind of happening at different times in the 70s but, yeah but the 60s definitely well i guess i can't really say that the early 60s had a sound and then the later 60s had a sound yeah so when they dump it all into one i mean you do get you get the memories but there it's not uh not a consistent sound yeah man you said something earlier and i was like oh that's big i got it and then i forgot it so when I'm watching this Sorry. again, I'm going to remember it and I'm going to email it to you or comment it. I may comment it, but there was something there. I was like, oh, it's a good one. Well, so, so we, we tackled this thing about what is math and, um, and you were talking about the games that can be played mathematically related to machines and ideas and emotions. Yeah. And, uh, in there, you started thinking about what is a thinking machine. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all in terms of what's going on today with computers or. Yeah. So uh, again, I don't read a lot. So everything, all your, your viewers should, they should bias everything I say against that and fact check it all hardcore. Um, but um, uh, Alan Turing began his paper by saying, um, I propose to consider the question, uh, can machines think? And that was 1950. And um, uh, I don't really care how it's been received by other people. But when I hear that, it's like, okay, 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 I can play this game. Right. And uh, so I'm basically going, yes, yes. And, um, you know, like, can machines experience? Um, so if I take a thinking machine and I productively evaluate it with ideas, is well, 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 what's that? Uh, can we can we say that that's experience? Um, you know. So basically, I'm taking all machines that are answer yes to Turing's question: Can machines think? Right? And then I was saying, okay, given all possible ideas and given the productive evaluation of that machine with such ideas, right? All possible ideas. What, what type of experiences can we play with, right? Can machines experience? Um, and so basically, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where, um, that's kind of the, the little loop that I like to play because um, it's a bunch of yeses, right? Well, Okay, interestingly enough, what comes into my mind when I think of experience is that that has to be embodied. I mean, if it's just a head thinking, is that really an experience? Um, well, the key word there is Turing machine. So oh, because the Turing machine is... is I started with a moving. Turing machine. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because I what a Turing machine, machine is actually thinking. doing is, I, I mean, I might, I, I, I don't, I haven't done a lot of 
deep dive to try to understand what a Turing machine actually does. I just know that it it um, it reads and then it goes back and checks the rule book and then it comes back and right and then it's always going back so, and checking. I so the the sad news is uh, when you read Turing's paper, it's actually a hard place to learn from. Um, uh, and uh, if I had to learn what a thinking machine was from Turing's paper, I'd probably fail. Um, so, but um, but I can give you a, a brief description of a okay. simple uh, thing, thinking machine. Um, so this may fail from what he describes, but it's going to be fairly um, good. So um, uh, so in a thinking machine, um, you have registers, right? So already I'm using a device that's been invented that you didn't know even existed, but we've got registers and re registers um, store values. Um, um, they hold a value constant over an interval of time, right? So you can play philosophically with registers uh, for quite a while, have a lot of fun. Um, but um, yeah, so you've, you've got to get the concept of a register. Um, and now we're going to take that concept of a register and we're going to copy and paste that concept in a bunch of different places. And we're going to put slightly different functions on each one. Um, so we're going to connect registers and we're going to connect them with methods and rules, I guess. I don't know, you know, something. Um, so, um, is a register so, analogous to memory or? Yes. It's, um, it's like, um, it's like the smallest unit of memory, uh, above a digit. So, um, a register has, um, a least significant bit and it had or digit um, and it has a most significant digit. Um, and uh, however many digits are in the register is however many digits it has. Um, and that determines how big um, the biggest number the register can contain. Uh, is that how we got the word cash register? Uh, probably, but the, actually the computing register would have come after that. But a cash register had a certain kind of memory that, that is like that with a, a least significant digit and so, a most significant digit. So in, uh, in computers, if you can imagine the money that's in the drawer of the register as the value or the contents of the register, then that's what's going on in computers. So you'll have a register and it contains a value. So if you add up all the money, that's the value of the money in the, in the cash register. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to a computer register, you look at the zeros and ones and the least significant bit is two to the zero, that's one. The next is two to the one, that's two. The next is two to the three, two, whatever two, right? And it just, it just increments, right? It's base two. Um, and if it's zero or one, it, you either have that much value or you don't. And, um, and you form all the zeros and ones form the value in the register. Um, so, okay. So this is, so we're deep diving in a good spot, right? Okay. Okay. We're deep diving in a register. So that's a good spot, but, um, and, and we could spend forever on registers, but, um, uh, but electioneers have to keep moving on, right? So we take um, one register and say, we'll call this the working register, right? This register, this is where all the work is going to happen. And, um, uh, uh, and, and that's not a good way. Anyways, I'm, I'm basically describing a PIC microcontroller. Um, so they've got a working register. Then they've got um, a bunch of registers. They have an array, array of registers, a list of registers. And these registers are um, memory. So these, me these registers um, will contain a value that you want to recall. You want to access it at some point in the future. And 
some of these registers are going to be um, uh, very static, right? Like they really never change. Maybe they only change once or twice over the life of the computer. Maybe they change all the time or fairly often, but maybe they change never. And that those registers are usually where the program is stored, right? So you'll, your program is just a series of instructions. So, so your program can go in these registers and then uh, somewhere else you can have uh, other memory registers and data can go into these registers. And the data can be, um, you know, whatever, whatever you want it to be, right? So you can have program, you can have data, and then the working register um, uh, can be where uh, stuff is done. So the working register is basically the countertop at the grocery store sitting next to the cash register. Um, so it is a place where you can put stuff and you can work on it. You could do math with something else. Um, it, you might call it, um, if, uh, if I was thinking more psychological, I would um, be like, that's the place where focus occurs, right? Like you've got all this memory available, but the working register is where it's like, okay, boom. Like you, you loaded the working register. You focused on that. Um, um, so anyway, so you've got uh, memory, memory, working register, and then you have a, uh, a program counter, um, and it's another register, and it's going to uh, change constantly according to the clock that is driving the, the thinking machine. Um, and the program counter is simply um, an address um, pointer. I don't want to use the word pointer, but basically it's, um, it's, uh, it's a number which points to a spot in the program uh, memory. And that spot is um, the, the value in that program memory register that it's pointing to. That is the instruction that will be executed next by the thinking machine. So, um, so it's kind of elaborate. You've got to have program memory. You've got to have a program counter. Uh, a place to do work, um, data memory that your your program might want to make use of, um, and uh, I, I did not do a good job. I should probably just prepare a bit on that. But um, well, yeah, that's, you certainly that's a, told me more than I ever knew about how computers work. So I mean, I I think this is great because um, I I've, I've I've often heard of you know read write memory and random access memory and all that kind of stuff but i've never heard anybody talk about register so i'm assuming that register was in the earliest computers that that was the concept the register yeah and that that yeah. was, was that a concept in turing's work this register so, idea? Uh, you know i don't know how old the the i don't know who invented the register mm-hmm somebody did. Um, I don't know who did. And um, to be honest, it may be um, an invention that we don't know. And it, it most likely was invented many places by many people. So the, mm -hmm. like the, um, the, the manual or mechanical calculators um, with the sliding beads, mm -hmm. um, each slide is basically a register because it's a place that holds a value and they're doing math. So, um, so I guess technically that's a form of a register. So a few years ago, I saw this video. Um, it was an, an older gentleman talking about an adding machine. He had found this um, very simple computer and he was, he has lots of these old computers in his, his shop and he was showing this particular one. This particular one used something like a piano wire for the memory. Have you ever seen these memories that are just a coiled wire? Yes. And the vibration yes. starts in the wire and the vibration holds the memory until it's needed. And then yes. it's needed, it comes out. I mean, that was like magic to me that anybody ever figured that out. Now, 
would that wire be sort of the register of that machine or is the wire? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, well, so the memory, um, so the, the wire is the storage um, media. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the method of storage is in a time delay. Um, so. Um, wire is the media. And yeah, the wire. And the method is the time the delay. Yeah. So um, because the electronics are so much faster than the um, speed of sound in the wire um, or the, the, the wave that moves through the wire, mm -hmm. um, that they can put in, put in a pulse, um, go do something useful, and then come back and pick up the pulse to put it back in its, to refresh the memory spot that that pulse was associated with and re-inject it back into the wire. So it's like juggling. It's exactly like juggling. Um, if, if you, uh, that's how the machine, that machine works. Um, mm -hmm. so, so you've basically, you're juggling pulses, but instead of through the air, they're through the, the wire. Um, so, um, so the, the wire does kind of form a register in the sense that um, it's empty when there's no pulses and it's full when you've filled it with as many pulses as you can. So the wire forms a single register. You know, we live in an amazing world. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's all I've got to say, that there are so many different ways to, to present to, to create this function of, of, of a register of a memory, because I mean, the, the old adding machines, they had a completely different system for doing it. And then the early computers had another different system for doing it. It's like, there's so many places in this conceptual space where you can go and find a useful tool, bring it back and use it. But then as, as you progress in your knowledge of that thing, you can find a better and a more advanced useful tool from that same conceptual space. Right. I mean, I've always thought about this in terms of aerodynamics. How amazing is it that we live in a world that aerodynamics is such that an airplane that weighs many, many, many tons can lift off the ground and fly through the skies yeah, I mean, there yeah. are a lot of hidden gifts out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, the other crazy thing about it, what it's flying through is um, if you were not a human being, <clears throat> if you were a scientifically educated observer, um, but you were unaware of uh, combustion, <clears throat> you were unaware of... Um, um, how, uh, how a jet engine works or how an internal combustion engine works, um, then you would have to look at the technology of an airplane and not know how it works because you don't know the fundamental um, piece of knowledge um, that describes what's going on. Um, and uh, most people never think of it this way, but um, the, the weight of your gas tank is, uh, approximately, I'm just going to say approximately because it's going to not be precise, but uh, it's approximately only half the weight of the fuel that the plane is going to use to get to its destination. So half of the weight um, uh, of the fuel needed to make the journey is in the atmosphere. It's the oxygen. You don't have to carry it. Oh, 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 because because it eats the oxygen as it goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's half of the fuel. So so it's not just moving through the atmosphere. It's moving through half of its fuel source. I don't know what to do with that, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it sure is. Um, and, and isn't it, um, it? It brings to mind something that's just right there at the edge of my perception mass about some some birds something goes up through their 
Yeah, I can't remember it. But anyway, yeah, that that is fascinating. Huh. Because we never think about oxygen having weight. Yeah, but of course. it, it yeah. does. Yeah. In fact, you look at the periodic table and the that number that's down in the corner that's got all those decimal points, you know, a lot of those those numbers, you know, with those decimal points. There's a lot of uh, mass associated with those those numbers right there. Change one of those numbers, oh boy, good luck, you know. <laughs> uh, but but anyways, um, yeah. So you can just look at those numbers and kind of get a quick intuitive feel of the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen and carbon. Um, well, I mean, one one of the first ahas for me was when I I did some research to figure out where on earth does a tree come from. Because it starts oh, out from yeah. this tiny little seed and then it grows into this massive thing, you know. And I read yeah. up on it and it almost all comes from the air. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's absorbing carbon and, and other nutrients out of the air, and then that creates mass. And yeah, wow, you know, we don't we don't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's crazy. Um, yeah, so many, so many uh, intuitive games to play and things to spend time on. Um, well, so did you say enough, as much about the register as you wanted to, or did we, um, or we just on well, there? <laughs> well, I, I didn't do the computing machine justice um, in a, in my description, and so um, so I I feel inadequate, but um, and I, I feel like we talked about the as long as you know the well, register is so, important but you you said that it's a computing machine but how can you relate that to thinking oh um so okay okay so uh so i play another game um so so we, i've already kind of introduced momentum mass of an mm -hmm. idea forces and that kind of is the basis of idea space that should connect it to newton's stuff um but uh but even if we don't connect it to newton's stuff i'm having fun playing in different ways in idea space or knowledge space uh -huh. um so um so um so i say okay let's let 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 there be a, a normal existence term or um um yeah normal existence term um which is basically a um um like a, a space with space that's normal and it exists and then um uh, i start to take uh, change functions uh, of that normal existence space and i have a first change function second change function third change function and to me uh, in the games that i play uh thinking is the first change function of the normal existence term function uh in knowledge space so um so if you take that register which holds the answer to the question what number system are we going to teach the next generation mm -hmm. um the um um ah Thinking is the first change function. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So, so um, the position of the the register is the answer. So um, uh, you could even change it to be: Are we going to teach the next generation digits and decimal points? Right, and it went from zero of no, 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 and then Fibonacci, and it transitioned to yes, yes, we're gonna. We're going to teach the next generation digits and a decimal point. So that change is um, the is is uh, can be described by a change function, and so that's thought. In other words, that that's thought. So the normal existence term is no to yes, and the thought is the change from no to yes. So it's it's basically motion between ideas. Would this be analogous to what they talk about when they talk about criticality? That when you when you hit um, the point of criticality, you change in phase space. Okay, so I don't know what you're talking about with criticality, unless it's um, uh, 
It's uh, was it part Turing? of complexity it was, theory. So, so Turing in the same paper, um, uh, uh, computing machinery and intelligence, right? I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Mm -hmm. Far down in that paper, past a bunch of thought experiments I wish he didn't do, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I find one that I just was like, oh, okay, okay. There, yeah, there we go. So you got something. And, um, uh, and he used the word criticality. I think he used, or what, critical, yeah. So basically it was the 50s. Um, nuclear science was all the rage. So he wanted to connect, or he had ideas that were relevant that maybe were analogous to knowledge space. Um, so he described a computing system with, um, uh, in such a state where, what if you add just a tiny bit more information to this mm -hmm. system and uh, something goes critical and it's like, you know, something like that. So, so he yeah, played that, with that's this exact, thought experiment. That's exactly the idea. Because like, if you, if you have a pile of sand and you keep adding sand one grain at a time on this pile of sand, yeah. at a certain point, there will be a catastrophic, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm familiar from that. I think it's an interesting thought experiment. I don't have any conclusions. Uh, basically, my um, the way I abstract from it is he found the um, he's basically he he was exploring failure modes of computing machinery. Mm -hmm. Was what he was was what he was doing. Um, and so, what if there exists this type of failure mode? Should we be aware of it? Um, so but that's not, in other words, that's not what you mean when you say that there is a, a first or second or third change function. You're talking about something different. Yeah. You talk about a change function. Yeah, your mine. Change, in other words, simple. your change functions don't depend on criticality. They depend on something. No, else. existence. They just depend on existence. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, so this, this goes back to 2015. So in 2015, I, uh, I realized that emotion space, which you and I haven't really deep dived into here, but emotion space has a calculus framework that's uh, fairly interesting. Um, and I, I, I recognized it as a calculus framework. I called it derivatives and integrals, but I felt guilty doing so because I didn't feel like um, mathematicians would back me up on using the terminology. Um, that they worked so hard to give a very elegant meaning to. And I'm just, you know, broad stroking it over here. Um, so um, eventually I developed my own um, uh, set of thinking. Um, basically, if you, have, um, if you have a function, so, so given something exists, um, its change functions will exist when it changes and its integral functions must exist and be changing in order for this to exist. So, um, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Um, basically the integral of the derivative is the function. That is what that math says. Um, but I just said it a different way in, in uh, different words. Um, so I call it existential calculus. So change functions are derivatives and integral functions are integrals. So the other day I was reading a paper, um, I, I'm, I, I get this, uh, ac is it called academia? They send out published papers, you know, like three times a week or something, I get a published paper just on random topics. And sometimes they're pretty interesting. And, and the one that I got this last week was the theory was theories generate emotion. Ah. And when you read into it, I, of course, like you say, I have to find another analogy to understand what he's saying. But the analogy that I found to understand what he's saying is when Jordan Peterson talks about what happens to a person who gets locked into an ideology. And in that sense, ideology would be the same thing as theory in this paper. 
that a theory yeah. is analogous to an ideology. And when a person is living inside of an ideology and there is something that creates a cognitive dissonance with that ideology that creates emotion, it generates emotion, right? Mm. So theories are the same yeah. way. So if you have a theory of Newton's theory of gravity, and mm -hmm. then something comes along and says, oh, wait, no, it doesn't work that way. It's actually Einstein's theory of gravity, that that, mm -hmm. that generates emotion. But of course, that's on a grand scale, but we can have little theories in our life, you know, like uh, my theory is that uh, goods should be free. <laughs> but then, mm -hmm. But then as I grow up, I find out, wait, they're not free. They require money and money requires that I work and working mm -hmm. requires that I have to mm -hmm. get up early in the morning. And, you know, that generates emotion because the, the way we wanted the world to be isn't the way the world is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's what he's talking about when he says theory generates mm -hmm. emotion. Okay. Now, is, when you talk about emotion, emotion space, having a calculus framework, is there any crossover at all with that idea? Uh, yes, yes. So a lot. Uh, now, I'm, I, I, um, I've been a little bit more um, cruel to myself, maybe, than other people. So, um, so I keep uh, clear and distinct lines between um, knowledge space um, and emotion space. And um, uh, so to me, a theory is an object in knowledge space um, and uh, emotion is an object in uh, my nomenclature is a little bit uh, dense but uh, in emotion space so i use the word emotion for both the space and also sometimes the position in the space or an object in the space um, so while my my nomenclature for knowledge space is a little bit more um, spread out. Emotion space to me is still emotion space. Um, but um, uh, the word experience is related to emotion space. Um, um, and so anyways, but so uh, theories generate uh, emotion. Um, so a theory would be an object in knowledge space. Um, generate is a word I'd want to hear the game a little bit more about mm -hmm. um, when he when he uses the word generate. Um, I'll read up on Faraday, it. I'll read up on it and let you know. Yeah, I think Faraday uh, invented the generator, right? And I don't know if he called it the generator, the electric generator. Um, and I would kind of I would want to think about those ideas a little bit more before I. Kind of launch into a abstract um you know this generates this i don't well, i haven't played a generator maybe, thing. maybe you could just use the word cause though i mean that that in other words emotions arise out of theory yeah so um so i i uh so um so i i hung up on the word generates but um uh theories um something in the middle maybe it's a generator uh and then the result of the theory and generator is the uh emotion that's kind of how i'm looking at it um in in my thinking um where he's got the generator i put um all of um time space matter and energy um and that's where thinking machines exist and to me it's um, the better thought experiment is a lens. So I, I think of knowledge as a light source. I think of um, the generator space that um, that uh, the word generates would be associated with as um, real space or a lens space. And then I think of emotion space like a, a screen, a screen space that can capture um, the light that has passed through the lens um, due to the uh, illumination source. So, um, so that's a different game. So he's trying to play a generator game. So he's going to be, he's going to have a machine 
uh, in real space that he calls a generator and theories are going to go into the generator machine and emotion is going to be the output of the productive evaluation of those theories by that generator machine. Um, at least if it, if that's what he's trying to say, but that's how I would, but if I agreed with him in a room, that's what I'm uh-huh. thinking. So I might agree okay. with him for a different reason than what he said. Uh-huh. Well, no matter what he said, that's a beautiful picture that you just drew. <laughs> when you said that knowledge is a light source. It's a, that it's that a, in itself is a beautiful thought. I mean, it, is that something you just came up with or did you come up with, did you read oh, this? It's, um, uh, Newton played with light. Newton was a big lenses guy. Uh huh. Um, so the same thinker who played the game of force and momentum was the same thinker who played with light sources, lenses, and screens, and filters. But did he say that and knowledge for, was a light source? Um, I don't. I don't know. Um, uh, probably not. Um, but maybe. I. 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 I there, there's. There's. You know the word illumination has been used by so many different groups of thinkers of all different styles and flavors across numerous cultures and Uh years. Somebody said it somewhere. And then when you said that emotion would be the screen that captures the light that has passed through the lens. Well, that's what we're thinking thinking about for a long time. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm trying to yeah, understand so, the picture, but it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah. So in, uh, yeah, um, yeah. You have, I mean, a screen capturing a light beam mm-hmm. is not exactly a simple analogy, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of asking a lot, but um, yeah, that is kind of what I'm, if, if I use the light source lens, screen analogy that's that's what i'd have to ask um well, so let's yeah, like, play with that it? a little let's play with that a little bit we have one of these phosphorescent screens or whatever that, that kind of they they bounce the light back off right when when it's when the light's projected onto the screen it's also bouncing the light back off and i'm assuming that the color that that we perceive on the screen are the 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 colored the messages from the color that that bounce back off the screen to our eye that's what we're seeing wow so you just asked you 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 just touched on the distinction between screen and film okay yeah so so i i don't know i don't know if um maybe my screen breaks right maybe maybe uh anyways yeah because with a screen, with a screen, it reflects off, and the, the 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 image is detected somewhere else, or the light is detected somewhere else from a screen. But doesn't that give you a richer concept of emotion? Yeah. I mean, to me, yeah. that that develops the concept of emotion on many levels because our emotions can. Our emotion is one thing, but then it it reflects outward to people as maybe something else, but it can also reflect inward to us to give us a signal that we need in order to understand what's happening to us because emotions are sort of immediate. immediate emotions aren't something that we generate. Emotions just arise, they just happen, right? Right, right. Uh, and and they happen for reasons, <laughs> but it's not our own yeah. reason that's that's making the emotion happen. It it just is there. So sometimes we need signals from the emotion to tell us, oh, I'm I'm experiencing depression because maybe last week I was angry and didn't deal with it. So maybe there's something I need to go back and look at to understand better. Or or right now I'm feeling really calm and maybe I can learn something from that. What is it about my circumstance right now that's making me feel calm? So emotions are a a kind of a register in a sense that give us information and that store 
memories and you know i mean there's to me there's just a riches there of thinking about it as a screen where the the light source has a purpose but it also bounces off as a reflection so i don't know yeah i'm probably yeah. <laughs> i'm so, doing blah blah, blah. So, um <laughs> i don't know if we've gone too long but um uh uh and it's probably in the last video i i don't remember details too much but um emotion space um the first level that i look inside emotion space um i have the concept of force in emotion space so we already looked at the concept of uh force in knowledge space well i think there's also the concept of force in emotion space and um and then wh what um what i do is um i say hey let let emotions be equal to force times now i'm i was looking for an analogy for energy and um uh work uh is basically change in energy in science um so and work is basically force times distance that the work accomplished right um so um so what I decided was to say that uh, emotion is equal to force times feelings, and the feelings um, are um, basically related to the force. So, um, uh, and then force is um, two terms itself. So it's ability and ambition. So, um, so, so right at the top level in emotion space, I've got three normal existence spaces that productively evaluate together to create emotion space um, so ability space uh, ambition space and uh, sensory space which is feelings um, so so uh, for the screen um, uh, there's something about it there's something about the screen capturing or the film capturing that um, I haven't tried to map to those spaces. And so something may break there. If I try and do that mapping, I haven't really taken my thought experiment down that. Um, but, um, but feelings is, um, feelings is um, intuitively, right? So this is what I'm playing with for feelings. So if you draw a box and say this is a, a sensor, um, you, ha you have a, a sensor system or component um, with inputs and outputs, um, and the outputs are feelings, right? So let's just say this box exists and the outputs are feelings. Um, well, what I know about sensors is it's kind of on a, um, like a transition, uh, not a transition, it's, um, well, there's something, um, uh, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's like a domain transformation from say one domain to another domain. Like that's essentially what the sensor is accomplishing. So the microphone transducer or sensor um, on the headset is transducing from pressure waves to uh, electrical signals, um, so it's it's bridging a uh, uh, it's it's bridging a domain. Um, so we've got the the pressure, the atmospheric domain with all the pressure waves going around, um, and then it's going into the electrical domain. Um, so a sensor is a transducer between sensitive domains, something like that, right? Um, and I really don't have to do this homework; it's in all the books. I just you know. I uh, haven't played with it from the emotional perspective like this. Um, well, so if you want to talk again about these things, we we are have gone a little bit long here, but if you want to talk again about these things, have um, have you heard about the Markov blanket theory of uh, Carl Friston? Uh, no. And so you don't read very much, but do you listen to videos? Because I could send you uh, Carl Friston's explanation of um, his idea of how Markov blankets work in the in the human well in in living systems.
because the Markov blanket is exactly this picture of the sensor with the inputs and the outputs. And you, you, would, you would see something right away about what you've been thinking about. And you might see, you know, you don't have to accept everything that Carl Friston says, but it might give you some analogies to work with, right? You might agree with him or disagree with him, but it will give you a picture that might help you explain this idea because I, I, I think mm -hmm. you're really onto something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I'll send you that and um, you can Thank take a look you. at Thank it. You. And if you want to talk about it again in the future, we can talk about it because I, I really think there's something in this whole idea of Markov blankets because wow. Thank um, you. because I think it's a picture that shows up everywhere as well. But I've always felt that there was some little thing missing in the way that Carl Friston looks at it, which is an arrogant thing for me to say because he's a doctor with all sorts of education. But, but it just feels to me like there's some piece there that is a little too clinical or mechanistic or something that's missing something on uh -huh. that, right? So, yeah. so I'd love to have you take a look at it and see what you think. And this has sure. been fascinating, Nolan. I, I I apologize for taking you off in so many directions because I know that you have a kind of systematic mind and you like to you like to think about things in a certain space, but my I, only regret is I can't explain everything perfectly. <laughs> well, don't worry right? about that. It's not the it's not the journey, it's the error. <laughs> Even if you could explain it perfectly, I wouldn't be able to understand it. So um yeah. Because yeah. my my mind my mind synthesizes many different things. Your mind goes yeah. down a path and and makes sure that that path is organized and makes sense. And so, I think between the two of us, we make a kind of an interesting combination. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I'll be in touch. Thank I will you. send you this Markov blanket thing and uh, in a. If you listen to the video and something comes up that you want to talk about or explain later, we can do that too. Okay. That sounds great. Thank okay. you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too.